Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Bench Units Exclusive Edition, where we're going to talk about Euro Cup 2. I'm joined by James. How's it going, James? Yeah, it's going. How are you? Yeah, uh, slightly more enthusiastic than you by the sounds of it, which is uh, as different to usual. And we are joined by our unofficial third member, author of the correction section, which, to be fair, we've got a little bit loose on over the last few weeks. Um, reigning European world champion. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't even get through that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Mandel, times, I guess. how's it going, man? I'm well, thank you. Thank you. It's very nice to make James so happy on a day like today. <laughs> oh, thanks. Yeah, I'm not actually too bad. I just couldn't think of anything, so I nailed it in. My, yeah. my like, neutral is, like, yeah, four out of ten. <laughs> so I just nailed it in. Sorry, I'm actually doing well. Thank you. So, Mendel, thanks for being here, man. Um, so, as you already know, because we briefed you, but for people listening, we have been doing these EuroLeague kind of previews. We had Jan Aller on a couple of weeks ago to talk Euro Cup 1, and you are going to tell us, hopefully, a little bit about Euro Cup 2, which could affectionately be known as the Wild West Open Invitation of basketball teams that nobody has ever heard of. <laughs> so, should we play our opening segment, James? Yes, so we sent you the rundown, so you kind of have half a spoiler on this, but we thought it would be fun to see if you could pronounce the names of all the teams going to EuroLeague 2. Um, well, yeah, let's find out if you can do it, and let's find out if it'll be fun, <laughs> I guess. So, I'm ready. Um, it'd be really good if we had a list of these guys right in front of us. I do. Bit. So that's good. Okay, let's hear it. Would you please list the names of the teams that are going to be in EuroLeague 2? Well, we have the hosting team, which is Dinamo Lab Banco di Sardegna Sassari. Um, oh, oh <laughs> Mendel, behave. Show uh, then, 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 then we have uh, Team B on my list, which is the Polish team, um, which I have no idea to pronounce. It's KS Paktum Shijori Kilce. Is uh is my attempt. That, um, that which sounded, you call me enough that I believe that they're called that, and if they're not, they should change their name. I will ask uh, Bundy next week what it's what it's called, and I'll send you a voice memo. Awesome. Um, which I think is the team where uh, Marcin Balsurowski is coaching uh, right now, but I'm not entirely sure. Uh, and then we have undefeated my... in the Polish league. I don't know how much that scares you. Well, a little bit, because they have one team that is run by Piotr, and that is, well, it's always good to be to be Piotr, I guess. Um, then we go for the French team, which is, I have pronounced this wrong for the beginning of the season, but I think it's pronounced Andy Basket, Le Puy en Velay. That sounds believable. Then yes. we have one of the funnier names around, which is Mets Red Dragons with an apostrophe S. Um, <laughs> I didn't know uh, nobody really knows why, except for, I guess, uh, Whoever non, non-native mistake. English speakers. Yeah. Um, and then we have, well, arguably, arguably the easiest of the five, which is on my list, KKTC Wheelchair Basketball Team. That so, doesn't, you hilarious. have to say that in a Turkish accent, though, for the oh, presentation to be correct. Well, Please I'm don't. Go Please don't. <laughs> I don't even know if you could like, unless we mentioned it was a Turkish accent, I don't know if you put one on in a way that would get you in trouble. I don't know if anyone listening would know enough. Like if it was accurate, it would be fine. And if it wasn't accurate, I don't know if anyone would be like, hey, you can't put a Turkish accent on. <laughs> you, you say no one knows them. I think we've both played against them in EuroLeague previously, separately. Oh, okay. Against the Turkish team? KKTC? Yeah, it, this is going back ages, but it's where, do you know Ibrahim Yavuz, who yes, of course. is of the Turkish man, he used to play there and he used to run the show. And they also had a really old guy who looked like one of the bad guys from Taken, but he could make a top of the key post up like you would not believe. Mm. Hey, um, there's your first, hey, you can't say that when we're talking about Eastern European wheelchair basketball teams. Yeah, yeah. it's all right. I'll, I'll take the hit. M- Mendel's done his bit and he's not offended anyone of any nationality yet. Sorry, um, he hasn't gotten to the last team on the list. It's fine. <laughs> I think we're, we only five teams for this tournament. Is that right? 
Yeah, that's correct. Actually, yeah. there were two top college teams coming. Uh, like there have been a couple of different iterations of this tournament. Um, also, like Zuzanak was coming at some point, but yeah. uh, they're also not coming anymore. Um, and at last, like a couple of weeks ago, one of the Polish teams dropped out. So we're just, just five teams left. Yeah. So we should probably we should probably mention that first up because we're going to get into the details of the Euro Cup a, a little bit later on. We're going to hear about your season in France first, but. To me, the fact that they've dropped down from what I think was originally eight teams to now five when there's the number of like plausibly good basketball teams who are going to be sitting at home this weekend who could have filled those spots. This doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. I don't know. As a competitor, it might suit you better that they're not drafting Madiba in last second. But how do you guys feel about this in terms of prep? Well, for us, it was always going to be a little bit of a weird tournament because uh, the Red Dragons have never played European basketball before. I think two years ago they played one like a, like a qualification round okay. for the for the Euro Cup, like it's happening in Lille as well uh, next week um, in Raden back then. Um, so they have not, they had we were gonna have to join the lowest rank no matter what it was. Um, so and and us as, as being a relatively stacked team in, in France were. Like, yeah, the, the, the competitiveness was always going to be like good, good for some games, but less good for, for other games, probably. So, yeah. Okay. Well, I guess it maybe in that case it works out because I think it, there's definitely capable teams who aren't going to be partaking, but also there's probably like it just because Euro Cup two teams have dropped out. I guess the available teams maybe aren't of that level. They're either too weak or too strong. Like you, you couldn't bring anybody up from the qualification tournament and you couldn't allow like, for example, Madiba or like Rhine River Rhinos. Maybe, oh, I'd give you guys a shot against Rhine River Rhinos. Um, but yeah, it's like tough to find somebody of an equivalent level who wasn't already taken to fill the spots, I guess. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. I actually don't know what the reasons are for teams to drop, to drop out, but... Um. Yeah, well, we... We don't know what the reasons are for teams to drop out, and we also don't know what the IWF's process was for putting any yeah. of the groupings of teams together. And yeah. Jan Haller said as much two weeks ago. Where he's like, that was an interesting, uh, interesting uh, process. Jan Haller described. Yeah, <laughs> I said this before. Like, I the only reason I'm glad that they don't do qualifying rounds and stuff anymore is because I don't understand the seeding. So it's nice that they're just like, here's where everyone's going, rather than sitting <laughs> yeah. in February and being like. So if this team comes second and it's a full moon. Yeah, uh, like... yeah, the, yeah. the weirdest one was when, um, this is going back a few years, but there was a three-way tie in one of the Champions Cup pools and Cantu, if they, they'd lost by 23 and won by, like it must have been 17 or something. So there was a game where if they won, they came second. If they lost by less than 23, they came third. If they lost, lost by more than sorry if they lost by less than that they came for it was like there was basically a one point margin for error between three teams <laughs> it's like i'm just gonna watch the games and then in x number of hours iwbf can put out like the little graphic with all the seedings and i'll stop trying to second guess them but they also seem to make it up as they go along so maybe i would have had as good a shot as they would no offense, I don't know. the one thing that i really really like that these tournaments can throw up is like a just that, hey, we need to beat this team by exactly this much and watching how many, like, how many things it changes in a team's approach. Like, watching a team that's such a, like, slow it down, grind it out, half-court team, be like, hey, we need to press for 37 minutes is so <laughs> much fun. And then the amount of times that you see a team that's like, hey, if we'd have just played normally, we might have had a better chance. I remember us in EuroLeague 1, the last year I was at Sheffield, trying to beat... Bushik passed by like, I think it needed to be nine. And we were nine down in the first quarter because we went out to press and they were just like <laughs> press resistant for whatever reason. It was like, well, we might have scraped out nine in 40 minutes. Yeah, that, yeah. Well, they were huge, weren't they? And we weren't. So they just went like skipping stones, big to big to big layup. <laughs> and it was like, okay, this is not what's yeah. going to happen. Here. But anyway, that was years ago. And even if it had been yesterday, it wouldn't be relevant to what we're going to be talking about now. So no, talking um, about things that aren't relevant to your league, Mendel, we haven't spoken to you <laughs> since just before. I, I, saying your name so loud wasn't meant to be the point of emphasis. <laughs> uh, we haven't spoken to you since 
um, before chips. We obviously famously don't speak if it's not on a podcast. So just wanted to get your cliff notes sort of impressions on how the year was went before it all fell apart. Obviously, we spoke to you just before then and you said that you guys had a real chance to do something if things went well and things came together. I believe uh, Mendel's exact words were Netherlands to make the finals. They were just yeah. said through me. Yes. But well, yeah. Yeah. Um, that's an interesting question because obviously everything that happened is has been quite like, uh, like the, the picture I have in my mind is quite influenced by how it ended up being, which was uh, not great. But um, like we had a, we had some games where we really showed, I think, what, what we could do. Um, like against Italy, we really didn't give, give them a chance. We played well defensively and we shot the ball well. And like, I wasn't super happy. Like, I think our floor was too low in, in, during the tournament. I think we should have and could have been quite a bit better than, than what, we, what we were. Um, but we had some, uh, yeah, we, did, we ended up having enough quality across the board to, to pull it out in some games. And then obviously, the, like the, the game against Germany, how that ended up was a complete like miracle, I would say. Um, it was a, yeah, it was, it was fun to be a part of, but also frustrating at times. Sure. I think that's the thing when we speak to anyone who was there, everyone's like, yeah, the tournament was marred by not feeling safe. <laughs> like, um, but yeah, yeah, I don't yeah. want to, this isn't a let's dissect the, the organizing committee of that tournament podcast. <laughs> well, you haven't done any, any of the dissecting in, on this podcast yet. So I was, I was wondering if you waited just for me. Oh, well, we can't. No, I just, I, I don't. The floor like is that. yours, man. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, no, no, I'm good. I'm good. Uh, okay, he's all talk. <laughs> right um yeah i mean we've obviously we've had a couple of the german guys on relatively recently um tommy Burma was with us and then jan was oh we tried to get tommy in as well because you if you remember you threatened to arm wrestle him oh but, yeah um yeah we tried to message him and all we got back from his instagram were a load of messages about how much money he'd made on cryptocurrency which definitely <laughs> Definitely wasn't a hacker who also got Tom O'Neill thorn. Um, <laughs> Same guy. Yeah. You think one of them had it first and the other one was like, oh, crypto sounds good. <laughs> um, um, yeah. Know. So we spoke to a couple of German guys. They obviously had the reverse story of what you've just said about that semi final, where they obviously didn't consider that a miracle. But well. this is, um, I guess it's, it's a weird one because it kind of gives me, you guys winning the Euros in, semi controversial fashion i guess um and then a load of your team is obviously at your red dragons club now is kind of a similar feeling to what i think it was when gb won the world championships and then four gb guys went to madiba that same year and mm. i think there's an element of like hey we just did this we can hit the ground running obviously the euros was part way through the season so do you think that kind of took you guys into at least the second half of the French season with a level of momentum? Well, not really, I'm afraid. We had a couple of, of things that didn't go as planned during the season. Um, one of them was that Flacco had some uh, trouble with his visa coming, like firstly coming uh, in September. Uh, he showed up late. He showed up like, I think, one day before our game against Le Canet. Um, and also he had trouble with his visa again coming after Christmas. So that was the only... You, you only arrived and, and actually the, the British guys as well uh, uh, Finn and Callum they also arrived like somewhere in February I believe so uh, oh, yeah. th that has been weird and then also we changed coaches uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, Julien he was our coach for the beginning of the season and he was he was kind of thrown into the deep end if you ask me like he had hardly any coaching experience and a lot of expectations to make through through so um so that really, like, it did, ended up not working out very well. And um, Robin was in contact with uh, with uh, Josef Jachlowski. Um, and your yeah, pronunciations you, you, are, are flawless across all languages. <laughs> Just like uh, you, you have, you have no idea. So let's wait. Up, let's wait for Bundy to listen to this podcast, which you probably, <laughs> obviously won't. But uh, um, and yeah, it's it's been very interesting to have him around. Like he's uh, um, probably the most experienced coach I've ever had. Um, and yeah, he has a lot of, lot of uh, knowledge and experience to, to pull from. So um, 
but that also has been definitely uh, an adjusting period right now. So, like it still is. We have played now, I think, three games under him. Um, and as the team is set up, we don't practice with the whole team that often. So we have had, I think, three or four team practices now since then. Um, so it's, uh, I would not say that we like hit the ground running a lot of times this, uh, this season. Um, yeah. but, uh, we still have some time for the, like to like, obviously the, the first game of our Euro tournament is going to probably be the most important one. We start against Le Puy, yeah. um, which I think, yeah, Le Puy and Sassari are going to be our two most, our two hardest, uh, opponents. And then. We still have a couple of oh no, and then actually the weekend after we have we go straight into a uh, French Cup, so um, we actually stay in the in the south of Europe uh, the whole week, uh, so we go to play play the French Cup in in Nice. Um, but that, that was must, what that I was going to say. Is that we, sorry, Mark. That must be awful. I can't think of anywhere worse to play a tournament. <laughs> yeah, it's it's interesting because our president is actually originally from Sardinia, um, so we're gonna stay there. Oh, awesome. a little training camp. Um, and then oh. take the boat to Nice. Yeah, man, what what a ter- what a terrible journey you guys are having to take to get these tournaments in. Oh yeah, somebody's <laughs> gonna do it. Um, sorry, just going back to the change of coach. Obviously, these things take time, and the effects kind of develop over a longer period of time. But could you tell us like some things that you noticed that changed or got better immediately, or? very soon after his arrival i'm always interested to see what sort of stuff someone coming in can bring within the first couple of weeks yeah so it's been very interesting um joseph has been i think very realistic most of the time about um what he is here to do for these last couple of months of the season he's he's very much of the mindset that he's here to to help us we're here to help him and and yeah we, we we have to find out like how much can we still change at this point um but he's very yeah, he's he's being very uh, much of, of service to the team, which is uh, which is very nice. And and one thing that is was up was from the beginning a very big difference between him and and our uh, former coach Julian was that um, like just just the fact that he is so experienced and has has coached like honestly a very very impressive amount of uh, impressive players. Like he's coached um, Troy Sachs, he's coached Joey Johnson. Um, uh, Colin Price, like he's, he's been around for a while. Yeah. Um, so he's not afraid to call us out, which is great. I think like having a, a new coach coaching a team uh, in, in like, like for example, Julian, uh, a team with a lot of experienced players, it, it's, I think sometimes, and, and I think that's natural, quite hard to, to be hard on your players if they're lazy, if they're not executing what you ask them to do. And, and Joseph is the opposite of that. He, is, he has no problem uh, yelling at us when we are uh, slacking. Okay, so you think maybe bringing someone someone in with a bit of pedigree might might make a bit of a difference culturally, perhaps. That, yeah, that for of, sure. You see that a lot, like even as high as NBA stuff, like star players go to a team that have a young coach, and within a year, it's like, nah, get this guy out of here, get me, get them someone they'll listen to. And I'm not yeah, saying yeah. you guys didn't listen to the old to the old coach, but maybe that sort of that guy need that guy having a a less developed CV in the world of wheelchair basketball made a difference to how much you guys took on board. I don't know if that's the case, but I don't know the rest of your guys to say that, but. Well, it was actually not like mostly just about um, what they brought, like what the coach brought to the table. Like, I think Julian was kind of happy to be learning from us as well. Um, and, and, not in in the spot to to really call us out and stuff and and joseph definitely is so like i think if, if when julian said something we would definitely take it to heart and and try to execute as well as possible but um yeah like joseph is not not scared to go back to the basics to be like hey why did you why didn't you box out or yeah. why didn't you why did were you ball watching where you should have been defending your weak side uh player yeah you're um, giving all and, the secrets away ahead of your euro cup here you realize that yeah, well, it's it's. I, I hope that uh, boxing out will will work nonetheless. <laughs> well, um, I guess that it's maybe not a fair question at this point because you've obviously changed coaches so recently. But one thing we were talking about, we wanted to ask you, is kind of the maybe the pinnacle of the French league question is 
you guys have been pretty successful all year and you've struggled against Le Canet, who are going to Champions Cup and are obviously have been and currently are the best team in France. Yeah. I think there's enough talent on your guys' team that it's definitely an even-ish matchup. And I think it's weird because if you told anyone that Le Canet were capable of beating the Dutch men's team, which is effectively what your team is, it, that would seem like a, a reach maybe, but I'm just interested to get your idea on what you think the the difference is between uh, Red Dragons and Lacane at the moment. Well, I think it's a little bit unfair to compare us to the to the national team just because Bandura is such like a way better player than Quinton. <laughs> Sorry, my man. Uh, but... He won't listen to this. Well, he, now he might. He will um, when we tag him. We'll, we'll make that the soundbite. <laughs> Shit, that was, that was dangerous. <laughs> uh, I should have known. Um, no, just for real. Um, let me see. Um, the thing is with Likane, they are they have been together in this this constellation more or less for quite a long time now, and they are a super physical team. Like yeah. they play f- like arguably four bigs um, most of the time, uh, three or four, um, which. Like they're good bigs. They have the probably the, the tallest 3.5 that I know of, and one of the most skilled trios that sits max height that I know yeah. um, in uh, Crystal Carrier. Um, so they're a very hard team to play against, um, both offensively and defensively. Um, and I think like they're probably their weakest point would be outside shooting, but that was what we tried to uh, take advantage of in our last game against them. And Alexis Sanchez, oh no, it's Alexis Ramonet. Uh, he just shut the lights out. Like it was, we were like, let's, let's try to pressure him uh, within the three point line. And he was like, well, I'm going to make these shots with a hand in my face, without a hand in my face. I'm going to try and to buy you. Um, you also can't take one push towards him because before your hand is off your wheel, he's gone the other way and he's at the basket. Yeah, we hope we had a little bit of a home advantage there because home court advantage because our court is, I think, like the softest course court I have ever pushed on. Um, so I hope it would make his ability to do one on one people uh, to mitigate that a little bit, but it did not. <laughs> you, know, you know, it slows the defenders down as well. <laughs> yeah, well, I would say that is that would that would theor- theoretically be an uh, an advantage for the defenders because you're both standing still and you both have to start pushing. So it's like. I think it's it's easier to to stop someone when they're like I think the advantage of of a strong first push is a little bit mitigated, but sure. well he showed that he can still make it work. So um, and just every mistake you make, they're very efficient at punishing. Like they have three bigs uh, at least uh, at all times, and one and a one zero that is just a very good sealer uh, and a pretty good ball handler as well, actually. Um, so if if is from just the cohesion of having played together for so long then yeah they execute very well like i i remember the first game we played against them uh our guys had a couple of moments where we were just not used to like such such solid picks <laughs> robin was like yeah you know normally i can i can shimmy my way, my way around this pick and get back into defense but just it just walls yeah um yeah. well which, the, the the moroccan guy also offensive fouls on every pick he ever sets we should we should clear that up before we- <laughs> Well, like I have, I have uh, successfully sometimes have uh, put myself past thinking about French refereeing. So, uh, <laughs> sure. that, all right, that's, so, that's not a dig at the refs. That's a dig at my former roommate there. Um, so, to, to summarize, they have five ga- They have five guys that play together a lot, and that's not fair because you, on the other hand, only have four. <laughs> <laughs> Four and one guy who's better than the usual fifth guy who plays. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sounds, stop giving this sounds like you're up against it. so good. Well, I think like the thing that is showing up um, was also the thing that I started this podcast uh, talking about, which was like what what sometimes happened at Euros, where we just couldn't execute at the same level consistently uh, all the time. And if you're playing against a team that is quite a bit taller than you are, which like we are not a tall team. Um, you need to execute very well. You need to find the open spaces quickly. And, and if you don't, like you, your, your, your advantage is gone. So, um, and sure. playing in the, in the French league, like to be fair, I think like six out of the 11 teams, we, we, you can beat by 50 uh, on, a, on a good day, which does not prepare you very well for that one game, two games that you really have to execute like 
at the best of your ability. Sure. Yeah, that definitely is a thing. There's um there's some real British league comparisons right there where it's like, okay, we have two important games this season and we will spend the games in the weeks prior to that winning by 70 <laughs> and achieving nothing. <laughs> but, yeah. But. So hopefully we can use this uh, this Euro Cup and then after the, the French Cup, which we'll have both first games against Lepuy, um, as like good uh, good games to, to, to make sure we are getting more consistent in, in that execution. Definitely. So we'll... We'll transition to kind of Euro Cup stuff there because obviously, like you said, Lapuia, your first game, they're the team you know best, which is a slightly weird scenario to be starting a Euro Cup with because you typically, it's always just bad luck that you start against the one team who you can't find any video of or do anything <laughs> in prep for and you have to watch them warming up and be like, hey, that guy looks like he can shoot, that guy looks like he can't shoot and work it out from there. So you're going up against a team you've played already. How do you guys kind of prep for Le Puy? And you mentioned French refereeing just now, so I'm going to throw it in and say, who do you think the Euro Cup supposedly um, neutral refereeing benefits in this one? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, probably us, honestly, because like just the amount of foreigners we have... Um, I think, like, arguably, could could uh, skew the refs the refs against us. The French being nationalistic as they as they are. Oh man, um, that's the sound bite. <laughs> well, I'm gonna give you. Uh, I'm gonna make it hard to hard to pick for you. Um, <laughs> I love how you, I love the idea of you saying something that you don't want to be the sound bite and being like, I need to say <laughs> something that is more interesting but less controversial. <laughs> you are blind to walk. <laughs> I'm just gonna gonna give our compliments here to you guys, and maybe maybe, maybe you're right. vain enough to make that to someone. Okay, right, that'll, um, that'll come. There's a question about that. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um. Yeah. So I don't know. Well, it's. it's uh, I don't think refs should be that influential on our games. Like, if if, if we play well, I think we should be able to to beat the we. Uh, in a in a comfortable enough manner that the three or four or five points that a that refs are going to make a difference shouldn't matter. But um, but it's been interesting because since the moment the moment Joseph got here, he was he's been very focused on on these Lepi games, uh, which I think is is the right thing to do. Um, but his his philosophy and and the, the, like mainly the, the defensive system that he tries that he wants us to play is quite different from the way we played Lepi the first time. Right. Um, the first time we really tried to not jump them a whole lot, um, just because they're most efficient and most dangerous inside, inside with their uh, their two bigs and uh, and cutting uh, and good passing from from guys like Lingbom uh, and the Moroccan guard. I forget his name. Um, the double M. Um, so we just tried to, yeah, to uh, to prioritize closing down the key and, and that worked very well against them sure. um, but on the other side Joseph is trying to uh, make us pressure the ball a little bit more not be too passive on defense and I think like if we can execute that well that will give some give them some real some real trouble but um, if you don't you give you're giving up layups as well so um, we're going to be uh, it's going to be interesting to see yeah I think they're um, you mentioned their bigs there I think they're Algerian four pointer uh, Omar Zidi I think his name is he's, yeah yeah that's him I think he's pretty underrated because he's been in France for so long and I think most of anyone who follows European basketball skews towards um, kind of Spain and Germany viewing wise but yeah I think he's he's had some big games and I think he is potentially a problem if you're pushing out and pressuring the ball all over the place. But I think the Mustafa and uh, Zouet Shala matchup of just the two quickest, most agile double amps, maybe non-Harry Brown division, like that, they should have just a camera centered on those guys, like screen within a screen, watch these guys race each other up and down and also oh, the yeah. games going on. Yeah, that is actually a lot of fun to watch. Yeah. <laughs> right. Shall we... We we're gonna. We've obviously touched on Lapui, who you know pretty well. So, you guys have come into this straight off the back of the season. So, I guess what do you guys know about the other teams, and how much prep time have you had? Is the probably the most obvious question at this point. Well, probably the most important factor in my preparations this year is that I'm 
playing bar basketball part time. Like in, in Gran Canaria, I would I would play I would like watch your league games or or watch our opponents for at least two weeks prior. Um, but I just did not have the time these last couple of two weeks. Um, so I actually started watching yesterday. I watched I found some footage of the KKTC wheelchair basketball team, um, yeah. which was very raw. Um, the footage um, and also the basketball at times. Um, <laughs> they played for most of the game they played a, a female one-pointer and for bigs as uh, some turkish teams uh do and well that's that that, that can always be challenging um yeah the polish teams i don't know anything i haven't looked for any footage but bandura didn't seem very worried so I, i'll take his word for it that's um, great you've been like hey we've got the inside track on this what do you think and you'd be like nah we'll be fine <laughs> Yeah, that was kind of what I was hoping to hear, though. Um, <laughs> and then for Sassari, I watched their game against uh, Porto Torres. I think two weeks ago, we were in a hotel and the game was on uh, and I watched it. Uh, and it was uh, obviously like some guys on that team I know quite well. Uh, Billy Bridge have played against a bunch. And then they have uh, Leandro Di Miranda, the Brazilian uh, four or four or five. I'm not entirely sure. I think he's um, four five off five. the top of my head. Yeah, four or five, I think. Yeah. Well, I don't want to end up in the correction section myself. <laughs> um, so I don't know. Um, and then uh, the, the legendary Italian one-pointer Spanu. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, they have an interesting, interesting team um, with a bunch of hard shot makers, um, hard shot takers. Um, so, uh, yeah, that was, that's, that's, that's kind of been my prep until now. And, and it's, the tournament's going to be interesting since it's just a round robin and that's it. Um, yeah, that's odd. So, yeah, I, I love that. The, theoretically, if there's a, a tie in wins and losses, the winner of Euro Cup 2 comes down to points difference, right? Which seems like the winner of any cup of anything should not come down to points difference. But here well, we are. I, I think technically, like, so the first thing is, is just wins and losses. The second thing is um, the points difference in between the teams that are tied. And the, the third thing is points scored. Right. But I think the fourth thing they look at is technical fouls or something, or the amount of amount of fouls <laughs> you made. So the fair play award, I like it. Yeah, well, I'm so that be, I'm I absolutely hate that. That that's awful, man. But to be fair, I think is it. Wait, you say it's technical fouls they look at. So is it most technical fouls is the advantage? <laughs> that would be absolutely <laughs> amazing. That would be nuts. That everyone should do that. That'd be great because it, the, everybody who plays just gets one tech every game. Techs don't roll over game to game, right? So you can't get kicked out for too many across a tournament. Wow. No, I love the idea of just the, like the let them know you're here award. <laughs> People come That's actually just leaving one for on the French teams. early. Because in, in France, uh, I didn't know that before I went there, but there's actually fines uh, if you get technical fouls. Really? Um, yeah. Uh, fines by the fine. league or, or by your club? No, by the, by the league. Um, I think the first one is 50 euros. And then I think if you make, if you get two techs or like two or in a sportsman, like in a tech in one game, the second one is 75 euros or something. Wow. Um, Do the refs get fined for calling on sportsman likes incorrectly all the time <laughs> the fourth quarter stretch? Because they well, should. And also, I don't think that's the case in Spain, but uh, if you get too many, I think from like six, you have like, like it also happens, I think in the NBA, uh, you have to sit out a couple of games. Yeah, um, six, it's 16 in the NBA. 16. Yeah, mm -hmm. which while we're about it, Luca got his 16th tech in the 81st game of the season. They waved it off and then he came back and injured his foot and is now out for <laughs> however long it may be. So, yeah, like that's obviously a, hopefully not going to happen here. But the, um, the, fa the fact that you get fined in France just makes me wonder how much uh, Nico Joancer is actually paid by Hiaz because I'm sure he gets a technical every game. <laughs> I don't, I'm not sure if that's true. He he gets he he he's respected a lot by the by the French uh, refs and players. Um, so, well, he, he is, but he also shoots a fadeaway every time he touches the ball, and then when he misses, he's like, "Ref, how am I going backwards?" <laughs> it's like, yeah, this is true. Do that by reflex. But he does get a lot of calls, though. So yeah. I don't think he has too much to complain about. He sure. does. Do you, do you have? Well, I, I, it is famously the people who have nothing to complain about that get taxed all the time. <laughs> like <laughs> nothing to complain about tend to complain because you, you got to get your edge somewhere um do you have a nico joance story before we crack on with more euro cup stuff um 
Well, I have one that I have. It's a secondhand story, but it's something that uh, the team, uh, the, the the Red Dragons, before they went to Mets, when they still played in Santa Volt, they once tried uh, with Sean Ser to uh, not jump him the whole game. Um, and it apparently threw him up, threw him off so much that he couldn't like he hit was like two for 16 in the first half or wow. something. Um, but then in the second half, he figured it out. And apparently somehow the coach decided that even though he just hit five out of five, they're still not jumping him in the third quarter. So he just ended up with 35 points anyway in one game. So <laughs> that's amazing. 35 after a two from 16 first half is yeah like my, my my stupid nico story as told on this podcast before was watching the french national team um with rose hollerman and her being like i don't know this guy who's he and i was just like watch this and he just canned three feet away like without touching anything as clean a shot you'd ever seen just all like baseline feet away it's like yeah he's pretty good yeah. he's a legend he's a legend he's awesome man um is it yeah is there another team actually who feel like they're at least Euro Cup quality, but I don't think they were in Champions Cup for a little while, but they've not done it for a few years now. I don't know what the decision was there or if they didn't want to, you know, it's expensive being based in Monaco. Maybe they can't afford the flights. <laughs> I don't think I think this season it's it's probably a good call because I don't know if something happened in, in their um in in the way they tried to build a team this season or this summer, but uh, they definitely lack some some support for uh, for Nico this season. Um, I don't think they play any high pointers except for him, um, which yeah. he needs some some good cutters and some yeah. some good finishes under the basket. And he yeah, I think the, the best years year was uh, or years was when they had Dominic Mosler, and it was like that's the perfect Nico compliment right there. It's like hey, yeah, he, they had Mosler and then shoot also... fadeaways. This guy can fly around like a rhinoceros and get near the basket. <laughs> yeah, and then last season I think they had they had Lalo as well, which yeah. is a very good fit. Yeah, sure. Oh yeah, that was weird. <laughs> That's so strange. I love that. Do you remember when that guy was there? Moment because I forget so many of them. Like I don't know why there's just so many people that I'm like, yeah, this guy plays for that team. Yeah. yeah. You Since you guys are very well known for watching the French league very well, uh, did you know that? Uh, uh, <laughs> oh man, uh, uh, what's his name? Carlos from Puerto Rico, uh, the guy that played for Malaga. Wow, he's he's playing for year this season. Yeah, I didn't know that actually. So if you yes, you're gonna have to bring the heat more than that if you want to call us out for not having our French knowledge. <laughs> Mendel, you're one of my best friends, and I dismiss your performances with the words eh, France." I don't think <laughs> you by telling me about people I don't care about personally. <laughs> <laughs> right before this gets into any more shot taking shall we shift on uh i can't take shots i'd probably miss them yet let's move on um radio what have we got next i got lost here so we've kind of covered the dutch thing and you've mentioned bandora briefly but um yeah i guess you mentioned flacco kind of arriving late on both kind of halves of the season so how has that kind of fit in with what you guys have been running? And do you feel like he brings you something that you didn't have otherwise that's beneficial? Is it still a work in progress? Um, I would say yes and yes. It is both still a work in progress and he's definitely bringing something that we are, that we wouldn't have otherwise. Um, just because he, he is so dynamic and, and such a good, uh, such a creative finisher inside that, that like, on, in most lineups, I'm the only one that is a that is a, like consistently good. Like uh, maybe Robin is a good finisher, undersized finisher as well under the basket. But um, I'm the only one that is consistently looking for those. And I think bringing uh, bringing in Flacco sometimes really switches switches our dynamic up because because Bandura is such a such so focused on outside shooting, and and so are uh, Robin and and uh, and Mustafa most of the time. So I think he he's he's very valuable to us, and especially with a lineup where we 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 can lay Melanie Hodgson in as well. Um, the Canadian 1-0, uh, I think like me, Flacco, Bandura, Robin, Moose, like any kind of configuration of those on the, co- uh, on the court at the same time is going to be very, very hard to deal with by most teams. Yeah, sure. Oh, sure. Uh, that sounds like a matchup for the, um, for the Turkish team you talked about who go four big. That's, this is where kind of the tournament stuff gets into it when you've got multiple lineups and kind of ahead of time, you're like, right, this unit probably is a go for this game. This unit probably will shelve for x y and z matchup have mm-hmm. you got you got any other ones up the sleeve or do you think you guys will comfortably roll out your starters most of the time i don't know to be honest i don't know i haven't uh i don't know what what Joseph's 
strategy would be in a tournament setting like that. Never. No, I, I don't know. I don't know. Awesome. You're going to okay. be like, hey, just roll the Dutch guys out. We know what we're doing. Well, we do sometimes. <laughs> sure. Um, does, like, that's what I want to do. Like, an average week where you have one team to play against for 40 minutes on a Saturday, obviously you can go, okay, Monday, here's what we're looking at. Here's how we're going to defend. Here's the lineup we're going to roll out. But does having to divide your time and your attention between so many different teams and different lineups change how you prep? Oh, well, you say you guys don't really train together as much as full-time teams anyway, but how does that change conversations you're having, videos you're watching, sessions that you actually do have together? having to prep for four teams at once yeah so partly because we're playing like we i think like four or five times in the coming six weeks we're playing them euro cup french cup then the last uh regular season game and then also because we're going to end up second in there and then third or the other way around uh, in the league we're going to play them in the first playoff game as well um so we're going to play them a bunch so we've been talking about look we for for the uh most part the last couple of weeks um and then, yeah, that, that's actually, that, that has been our focus um, since you always have got a new. So, cool. And uh, does, that's something I wondered, like, in my experience as well, and I, I just wanted to know, is it the same for you that, like, having less time between games means that you're not going, okay, how do we play this team? How do we look at that? How do we focus on what Sassari do here? And is it more about, like, looking internal and thinking, all right, if we do X, Y, and Z, we're probably going to be all right because I don't know. There's a little bit less opposition-focused game planning that can be done when you're like, okay, we thought about Lupui, and then we have this game in six hours. Like you don't really do a whole lot except recover and get ready to go again in there. I imagine. Yeah, very much so. Like when I say that we've been focusing on on Lupui mostly, that's actually not true because we've mostly been focusing on on adjusting to to Yosef's new systems, um, and then within the back of our mind, having like how we're gonna, uh, yeah, like employ those against Lupui. But um, we've m- mostly just been focused on ourselves, which is which is nice. Yeah, sure. So this sounds a lot like, I don't know. Obviously, it's kind of maybe a little bit anticlimactic um, because you guys play each other first game of the round robin, but this sounds a lot like you expect the difference in the winner of Euro Cup 2 to come down to yourselves and Le Puy. Do I hope so. Do you think, obviously you don't know the other teams as well, do you think having a five-team field kind of reduces the risk of a wild card? Because I think there's been, I think we've probably all been to Euro Cups before where there's like an early upset and you're like, oh, that changes the way the pools shake out and therefore has a big knock on effect into the, like the elimination stages. Well, yes and no. Um, like the, the, the concept, the, the, the design of the tournament before this was, I think, two groups of four and um, I think the top three would have, or the top two would have crossed uh, yeah. just for the semifinal. So you could have dropped a game in in the in the pool stage if you if you wanted to, or like if you if that was 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 what happened, uh, and you'd still play one of the the other top two teams, and and as long as you you won that, you're, you'd be fine. And right now, if you if you drop a game, you're just done. Yeah, like you're not gonna win. <laughs> yeah, it's um, high stakes so stuff. Yes, yeah, a lot of high stakes. It's like, and like it's it's a weird. It's a weird energy. Like I was really looking forward to a to a knockout stage, but um, I guess it is kind of a knockout stage. Yeah, every game is a knockout stage. It's kind yeah. of it's like the uh, the whole March Madness tournament or whatever, where it's like every game from last hundred and twenty eight down to final four is a knockout. Yeah, but yeah, it's cr- crazy times, man. I wonder if this format will catch on. I don't think it will because I think there's too many good teams in Europe to do pools of five and round robins regularly. Yeah, I think the only reason they went to it is just because how it ended up being with teams dropping out and participating. And and I don't imagine this is what they imagine it would be. No. And I guess like I, I'm going I could sit here and be critical of Ryan Robbins and how the tournaments have been organized and whatever, but also trying to pull something together like this and sort of project public health three, four months in advance is probably an absolute nightmare. Yeah. So like, it's not, oh, yeah. not an easy thing to do. Like, so I guess this is just what it is. I don't like the idea of Ron Robbins, but also it's not easy. 
Yeah, oh, yeah. I'm not blaming anybody. Our team's pulling out. Like, I'm not organizing anything like this anytime soon. <laughs> no. <laughs> no for anyone will. who was wondering, James is not running for um, what's Yitzka's role? Athlete representative on the IWF council or something like that. Yeah. Uh, we'll leave that in Yitzka's hands. Um, so I guess last kind of thing, maybe on the whole format, Mendel, is. I think you you've alluded to it briefly in terms of talking about French refing and physicality and stuff. We've previously described the French league as like watching dodgems or bumper cars or whatever else it might be. Um, how do you think when you go up against someone like Sassari, who the Italian league's typically pretty slow and grind it out unless you're Cantu running layups in on San Stefano in the um, semifinals? <laughs> Even uh, that, it was like get the ball over in 7.9 seconds <laughs> yeah there's no there's no press and there's almost an eight second call on bringing the ball up but um yeah how do you guys see yourselves being equipped to kind of match those styles um in terms of do you see it being tough from going racing up and down with Lapui to then kind of trying to dictate tempo against Sassari who will most likely be wanting to slow things down yeah, that's a good question, actually. Um, like, I think I think defensively, it's going to be a little bit of a... You, you can get a little bit of a breather more often than you can, you can, can in France. Like, in France, the defensive balance is, is so important, so crucial. A lot, a lot of teams have people flying flying away as soon as the shot goes up. Yeah. Um, like, that's true for Mo, that's true for Toulouse, that's true for Le Canet. Um, so... I think like that's just gonna, and we're, we're actually not actually great at that at that part of the game. <laughs> um, yeah. So that might gonna, actually help. Gonna be like a nice break when you miss a shot against Sassari, and you're like, oh, good, nobody is already under the other basket. This is yeah, nice. possibly so. And then offensively, I think um, we have been pretty good at, at dictating, like at playing slower when we need to. Um, I think we're not a team that is just just slashing and, and and pushing as hard as you can so i think i think we should be okay well you guys have the ultimate balance of playing fast and slow because three guys can fly around for 23 seconds and then bandora will have just been sat still behind the screen for the entire offense he's like hey oh yes throw it here if you need me yeah um i was gonna ask the question are you guys capable of speeding it up and i don't mean physically because obviously like you guys have the have the players to run but i mean are you guys capable of flipping that switch? Because you guys play, like, you have two guys that like to, you have two Dutch point guards who like to dribble the ball up and Mm -hmm. make a hand signal and inevitably ask for a screen on the elbow. And do weaves for 20 seconds. (laughs) That's that's a a hard thing. No, but, like, you guys, like, have a very clear half-court setup. It's really hard to make fun of you and not your team because I want to make fun of you as my friend, but not your team because <laughs> I don't actually mean it. But you know what I mean? You guys you guys have a very clear half-court structure, but are you capable if it needs to be done to flip the switch and just run and gun for 20 minutes? Well, we are capable of doing it, but the question is, can we do it or we need to do it? Um, and I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure about that. Um, but we definitely have moments where it, where it, it clicks very well. We pass, like we, we find each other very easily and, and everything just flows and, and we get to the basket um, very easily and, and, and efficiently as well. But um, we haven't showed that we can do that consistently yet. So um, it's, it's one of the things that we'll have to make sure happens. happens. Yeah. Okay. Um, cool. Should we move on to questions, or do you have anything else? Uh, I've got one one bonus question first, Mendel. I got one bonus question, part A and part B. What are you <laughs> calling the results of both Euro Cup one and Champions Cup to be? Oh, I actually, as I alluded to, I don't have a lot of time to watch basketball these days. Um, so let me see what we got in Euro League one. We have Landil, Turing, Cantu, Le Canet, Mo, Madrid. <laughs> James and Cole. Yeah. Um, yeah. Team James, otherwise known as Bill Lau, not Team fa- fa- famous, Famously known for one person and that person <laughs> being me. <laughs> exactly. Come on. Um, Just wait till David Maurice's face is on the logo after this season. 35 a game. <laughs> but yeah, what do you call oh, it, Mandel? 
MVP David Maurice, but then he, they're not winning. He, um, I, I think Tuting is gonna win it. I think Tuting okay. is such a good balance of of power and size and and like defensive aggression. Like just their whole their whole team can defend. Um, like just chair skills and 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 like just the, the mental part of it as well. Just so aggressive. Like yeah. uh, players like Jordi and and Linden. Like they just. They're not lazy on defense. They're never lazy on defense. And and just like if you compare that to a to a Landale, they just have more options. They can go inside. They can go outside. They can they can like and 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 it's hard for 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 a team like Landale to match up with that. Um, and I think like if, if any if any team can match up with it, it's gonna be Albacete. Um, but I don't know what's up with Lee because I think that Lee hasn't played uh, in the last couple of league games. So um, yeah, he has not played the last couple of league games. Yeah. I think no. Oh, I assume this is with a view to have him right in a couple of weeks. Yeah, I think I think, I think all, new inside track, and I'm, I think all expectations are that he will be back because I know from speaking to Ben, Ben was like, "Oh yeah, we're away to Vigo without Lee," but then didn't mention anything beyond that. So I assume yeah. he will, will be back at some point soon. And for, I hope so. for what it's worth, Albacete looked just fine against Vigo without Lee, so maybe that will also be true against Thuringen. Well, like there's, there's different, there's different things there. Vigo and two bigs on tooting it, but there there's quite a size difference there. Yeah. Sure. All right, and for one, yeah, for for your beloved former Gran Canaria, um, yeah, it's gonna be Gran Canaria. I think. I think uh, we have Fulhan over there, and there's one was another team that I was considering. Uh, yeah, Porto Torres also look competent for what it's what it's worth in that competition. I think yeah. outside of those three, I don't know if I buy anyone else's chances. Um, no, I, I definitely believe in Gran Canaria in that in that, uh, in that tournament. Then um, they might have to play like they'll they'll have to play uh, a little bit different lineups, of course. But just like the the, the Spanish one pointer David David, he's just gonna he's so solid. Um, yeah, I don't think they'll they'll miss a they'll miss, they'll miss a beat. Good old copy. Do you su- do you subscribe to our theory that Gran Canaria are only good because they play over points? As one bench units listener has told us, um, I think only is so harsh. It <laughs> helps, of course, it helps. But well, no, no, like obviously not because in Euro Cup they have they have shown uh, in the last couple of years. I, I say they, uh, I was there as well, but um, they have shown that they can they can make it happen uh, with with regular points as well. And and on the other hand, over. the Spanish <laughs> champion last season also played under points, so I like it's hard to. Oh yeah, it's hard to fault them for that. I think yeah. no, and also you're allowed to do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah. Um, well, you're allowed to stand up in your chair sometimes, some somehow, and I don't, I don't necessarily think well, that's no, good you're good. not. <laughs> well, well, you're not. But well, they allow it. Yeah, everyone. Yeah, we're talking about be like being allowed to and allowing things being like slightly. I don't know. Right. It's a, being legal and being permitted. There you go. Yeah, synonyms. Okay. Well. So you've called Gran Canaria over Hanover, so you might have another German on your list of Germans to arm wrestle at some point because Jan Haller is, um, was pretty confident in Hanover winning. So You have to be in different rooms to arm wrestle Jan Haller. I say, Jan can probably <laughs> tap you on the shoulder right now and just be like, hey, let's do this. Um, not because his arms are long, it's because he's outside your house and he has a problem <laughs> with you. So that's not true. All right. Uh, no, I, get- I like Hanover. They're playing very, very well this season. I think it's very fun to watch them. But um, yeah. yeah, they're gonna. Uh, I just think uh, Canaria are gonna, 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 gonna get it. Yeah, that's also the first game of the tournament, by the way, right? Yeah, it is. Oh, wow, Which uh, is insane. Fun. I, I think I, I may be wrong on this, but I think Jan mentioned it as if that was going to be the quarterfinal. But I think it's a pool stage first, right? So this they can still meet in the actual final of the tournament because otherwise it would be ridiculous if those two teams knocked each other out in game one i actually think they're straight into into knockout but oh man so okay yeah that basically one of the finalists is out in the first game <laughs> yeah which is rid- one of the finalists will finish fifth <laughs> is how that's going to shake out yeah Cool. Well, that means they're not finalists, or <laughs> that's yeah. how tournaments work. Right? Shall we? Questions? We've only got a few. Cool. Uh, yeah, we yeah. have one question from Finn Tonner, which was, 
uh, describe James and Mark in one word each. My brain missed the word each the first time, which was even. <laughs> those will will get you to answer the question truthfully, uh, as intended. That's hard. Am I going to be funny or just? Yeah, do whatever you want. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know if I can do what I want. Yeah, you can. We we can bleep it if we don't like it. Oh, I'm uh, so excited. Well, Mark is Mark is honest. Um, honest. <laughs> honest. Mark is honest. That, um, that's a positive spin on what you really want to say. Is how I feel. Yeah, maybe maybe you're not not that honest, just provocative, but. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, you gotta think of like the worst what? tactic in the world is being vague and polite like if you were like james is nice <laughs> that'd be like stabbing me in the chest <laughs> <laughs> um uh, golly uh, james is uh I don't know. Let me, let me. I'll get you one at the end of that. Ask me a couple of questions. Okay. I, don't, All right. I don't know whether to be happy or offended that you could think of one for me so quickly and then have to think about James so hard. Fine. Fine. Let's not. Let's not look into it. This could yeah. get strained. <laughs> um, question from Tom Smith: Who are you? Which is either a terrible question or a great one, depending on how you take it. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I make, me, make me think of, of uh, when I was like th- four years old someone asked me am I a boy or a girl and I said I just replied I'm a human um, oh man oh that explains which is everything <laughs> <laughs> so um, but that's that's more what I am not who I am so um, I don't know man I'm Mendel what, what, what do you want from me Tom <laughs> <laughs> that can be the sound bite okay <laughs> Uh, in relation to Euro Cup 2, who's your dark horse, if you think there is one? Uh, Euro Cup 2, that is the tournament I'm participating in, right? Yes. yes. Um, Glad we got that cleared up 50 minutes into the podcast. <laughs> you can buy the tickets, no. <laughs> well, isn't, isn't, isn't uh, the Polish team... Uh, oh, wait, that's the other one called Must, something with something with the Mustang. Mustang. Um, Oh, that would have been a nice dark oh, horse. That would have been excellent. You, you could call them the dark horse anyway, never mind the fact that they might show up at the last minute. <laughs> well, let's let's say the team must think it's the, it's the darkest horse of all. The darkest horse possible, and I'm kind of not going. <laughs> <laughs> all right. And do you think you're a better host than Mark and James? Also saying yes to one and no to another is great. That's on the table. Well, no, but roses. Oh, man. Okay. For people listening, me, me and Mendel had a fallout about this a while ago. While I was away, he went out of his way to message me to tell me how great he thought Rose was at hosting the podcast in my absence. So, yeah, thanks, Mendel. That didn't ruin my honeymoon at all. I didn't waste days crying. I know. <laughs> that wouldn't have ruined yours. That would have ruined Gabby's honeymoon. <laughs> like, <laughs> what is it about me? Is there something wrong? <laughs> Uh, well, so maybe provocative is the better word than better than honest. Honest, but fair enough. Um, yeah, we just need your word for James then, and then we can let you get out of here. Yeah, James is Irish. Well, that that's not particularly inventive, given that he's wearing a top that says Ireland on it. No, but there's more to it than that, I, I believe. But um, maybe oh, I'll find out this summer when I visit him. That's happening. That's so exciting. Oh, is that happening? Well, well Mendel's like, know. I'll be in Ireland. Will you be around? And I'm like, maybe, unless our summer program changes. Trying to make plans when you're a member of a national team is terrifying. Yes. <laughs> maybe I'm just like rot with anxiety. First but of all. I am, but. <laughs> uh, yeah. Man, there could have been, been a word as well. <laughs> See you there. Anxious. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine that. Some of you know so well being like jittery. <laughs> <laughs> all right, guys. That's everything. Um, Mandel, good luck at Euro Cup 2 and good luck at the French Cup and everything beyond that. Do you have anything you want to tell people about before you get out of here? Do you want to plug what you're doing with yourself as you've alluded to being a a part-time basketball player? Are you working on anything great for the future? Are you going to be back full-time anytime soon? Any nuggets you want to drop anybody? Um. I'll come. I'll come on the air to, to discuss that some other time. I think I think we've we've kept everybody long enough. Nice. 
I like it. What a professional. Ladies and gentlemen, Mendel. Mendel, thanks a lot, man. It's been great to have you. Welcome back anytime, as long as you still think I'm better than Rose. Peace out, everybody. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Have a good week. Bye. Bye.